I'm going to talk about systems, uh, well, kind of a family of systems that I love, and uh, maybe you'll come to love as well, um, which is to say the timer facilities of many different kinds of systems. Uh, first, I should get a few things out of the way. Um, I will probably hand wave some things, especially I'll probably say something like, this performs better than that. You should consider that not a statement, but a performance suggestion. What I'm actually saying is, this might perform better than that, and you should measure it. You know? um, and the other thing is, I might gore some sacred cows. There are people here who may have worked on systems I might talk about. So anyway, you, you, you've been forewarned. Um, so I was working on a um, UDP service, best effort UDP service that needed to, um, it's running at about, well, a couple hundred thousand requests per second, and its clients all need, uh, for every request, they need a timeout associated with that request. And uh, I got curious, in this case, the clients were written in Erlang, and I got curious, like, what is gonna happen when I try to constantly create and cancel 50,000 timers a second? Uh, and I started reading the Erlang runtime system um, uh, time code, and uh, this led me to um, Varghese and Lauk's 1987 paper, Hash and Hierarchical Timing Wheels, uh, which turned out to be pretty influential. Uh, they updated in 97 with some um, sort of results from uh, BSD and so on. And then uh, uh, Varghese in uh, 2004 published um, this great book, Network Algorithmics, which has the timing wheels as a, um, as a sort of a case in it. Um, uh, these, these papers are all really interesting. There's a bunch of related work in calendar queues that, um, that I'll talk about if I have time. Um, but anyway, at the same time, um, it turned out, I guess it was in the air because serendipitously around the same time, uh, a new timing wheel got um, proposed for Linux, was merged in 4.8, and there's a bunch of other really interesting things that are worth checking out. Um, so I'm gonna separate, um, there really are two kinds of uh, timer cases that I'm going to talk about. Uh, there's timers that you expect to run to completion, so timers that you, you believe will expire, and I'm going to call those optimistic timers. And then there's timers like my UDP service, uh, where you, you, it's going to be pretty rare that the timeout actually happens. Almost always you're going to cancel it, and I'm going to call that uh, pessimistic timeout. And uh, we'll see that there's actually a, a an interesting, there's a lot of space. What's interesting about these systems is that um, there's a lot of room for different choices. There's a lot of different, very pragmatic trade-offs you can make. Uh, I'll get out of the way the idea that basically there aren't a lot of guarantees from most timer systems. Basically, yeah, a, a timer scheduled to fire after T ticks will have its action executed sometime after T ticks if your clock is well behaved and, you know, many conditions. It's really hard to, and that, that I think should be a systems we love talk on its own, so I won't pursue that further, but it's one of the reasons that we can look at the space of design considerations and uh, uh, consider accuracy versus performance, because basically uh, already we know that to some extent or another our timing system is inaccurate, um, right? Uh, so we have to decide how much do we, um, we're in the, where in the spectrum do we do we we put that, and and how do we slide that around? Uh, there's also some things, the ways in which you can change the interface of a timing facility, and um, by doing so, provide. Um, you know, very different opportunities for your users, in particular range scheduling and periodic scheduling, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about that aspect today. It's very interesting though. Throughput versus latency, I think is something that we're just always dealing with all the time, is just this classic struggle. Um, and in particular, in timing systems, there's a lot of like opportunities to coalesce timers and to batch them, um, but doing so can you know can badly hurt latency. And uh, it comes to the idea of where we might want to do bounded work for timer interrupt, and especially to kind of prevent timer stampede and what happens when that happens. Uh, one thing I just wanted to throw out there: there's a really interesting paper recently called. Um, optimal probabilistic prevention of cache stampede, and uh, it's an interesting paper on its own right, and I wonder if that might be applicable to a problem like that, but uh, 
for now, I really want to get into the implementations. So um, I'm going to go in the basically the order that uh, Verghese and Lauk present these things. So the simplest system you could have, right, is you just put timers into an unordered list and every interrupt, uh, every, every, every clock tick, you walk the whole list and decrement everything. Uh, and I thought, uh, there can't possibly be any system that I'm gonna find that actually does that. But it turned out I did find one, which was Vixicron. Uh, I actually found that because apparently the original Unix cron um, uses one of the original calendar queue uh, implementations, the, uh, the uh, Frant O'Malley event list queue. Uh, and I was, so I was trying to find some associated source and I read the Vixicron source instead and was kind of baffled. It just wakes up every minute and scans everything. But uh, clearly that's probably not good for our case. So the, the next most obvious thing to do is to sort those lists, right? Is when we add a timer, insert um, in sorted order. And um, uh, it turns out that actually for small scale, this is not too bad, and there are lots of real systems that do this. Uh, I think the most surprising one for me was uh, Darwin, was the, that the XNU kernel does this and doesn't seem to have any other um, uh, facility for, for callouts that use any other structure. Um, but clearly, like, this is gonna be uh, linear time for adding timers, and uh, we're gonna need to add a lot of timers. Um, so clearly we're building a priority queue. Um, so the first, you know, the go-to structure that we usually have in mind uh, is probably a binary heap. There are lots of ways to implement priority queues. And if I have time at the end, I'll talk about lots of other approaches. But indeed, it turns out that um, heaps are a really popular way uh, to do this. And there are some great systems that uh, have done this. I want to especially emphasize, it's really worth reading the, um, the libEV implementation and the, uh, the Illumos cyclic subsystem. Both are examples of of uh, really, uh, what look like really tuned um, heap implementations that, um, you know, maybe uh, there's often some debate of whether uh, for, for the size of, for the, for the end that we're talking about, whether uh, logarithmic time is that different from constant time. And these are definitely implementations where uh, one could believe that this could be competitive with a constant time algorithm. Um, but. <laughs> There, whenever we think about sorting problems, right, and trying to get past that O of n log n bound, uh, usually one of the first things that we think about is, um, well, there is a way to sort in linear time under some conditions, and that's radix sort. So why don't we apply that here? Uh, well, if we had enough memory, right, we could uh, have one bucket for, um, uh, we could have one bucket for every tick that could, that where a timer could be scheduled, right? And just treat this as a ring buffer. We see here the, the sort of the frontier of time moving forward, going through the ring buffer, expiring timers, right? And then just to add a timer, all we have to do is drop it in place, it's constant time. Uh, unfortunately, either we would have to have an extremely uh, narrow range for scheduling timers or, um, uh, or, uh, or we'd have to use a, a phenomenal amount of memory. So, um, this is where I deviate from Fergie's and Lauk's uh, presentation of things. I think this is more interesting. Whenever, whenever we want to have a, a broader dynamic range of something, I think one of the things we should always take inspiration from is uh, things like floating point, uh, log linear bucketing histograms like HDR histogram, things like that. And that leads quite naturally to a hierarchical structure. Uh, and I think this is really the, the, uh, um, the nicest idea, um, at least in, in theory. Uh, so where we have several timing wheels, we, so we have these several ring buffers, and um, let's, let's use this as a trivial example first. Uh, so we would have, uh, if we have a clock that only ticks in seconds, um, then uh, we would have 60 buckets in the lowest ring, and then uh, 60 minute buckets in the next ring, and then 24 hour buckets in the next ring. And as we tick through the uh, seconds wheel, once we expire it, then we would cascade uh, the, the, the next minutes bucket down and potentially triggering several cascades. Um, and so th this, is, this is kind of nice. Um, you can see that trying to find 
Well, one thing that I, I didn't mention before, but which is very useful is um, for pretty much every system other than the unordered lists approach, uh, you probably have a programmable hardware timer interrupt and you probably don't want to wake up every tick. You probably just want to say, wake me up when the next timer is happening. So finding the next timer that's going to expire is a really important operation on these things as well. Um, you can see in this case that we have to, um, we potentially have to scan multiple rings to, um, to find the next expiring timer. Uh, this actually, um, so comes into the consideration of how we choose the sizes of these things. So obviously instead of seconds and minutes, uh, we'll probably take a number of bits from the uh, timestamp. And um, it turns out that, so the, the current Linux uh, timing wheel implementation does this, um, chooses six bits at a time, and of course uh, six bits means two to the six, two, means two to the six 64 uh, entries, which means that we can have a occupant, an occupancy bitmap in a machine word and we can um, check for the next member uh, in a single instruction. Uh, so that's really nice. Now I wanted to mention, uh, Juho Snellman wrote this great, um, this great hierarchical timing wheel implementation called RATAS that, um, uh, it does a bunch of really interesting things. It's worth reading anyway. The code is really, really readable. And he has a bunch of things to say about interface. But one of the things that he argues is that uh, you actually shouldn't do this because um, the only cases where you have to walk the wheel uh, are cases where the system is under low utilization anyway. And he argues that you should optimize for the high utilization case uh, rather than penalizing it. Um, so that's an interesting argument. I'll let you decide for yourselves uh, how you feel about that. Um, in the case of Kafka, um, there was sort of a, a well-publicized article of Kafka kind of crumbling under the, um, um, they had the, the same problem that I did with many cancelable timers and uh, they're using Java's delay queue which is basically just a binary heap, uh, was not adequate. The interesting thing about that timing wheel implementation is it's extremely simple, uh, like it's, it's almost trivial. So uh, if you're looking to understand this, it's, it's worth reading. Um, now there is an alternate approach that is also widely implemented. Um, the, <laughs> Varghese calls these like hashed timing wheels, although uh, I'm not convinced that this is really hashing in a direct sense. Uh, like basically that, the, the hash that is usually used is just taking the low order bits, right? Uh, and then the high order bits tell you how many more times through the, the ring you'd have to go um, uh, you know, for this thing to be, uh, to, to expire. Uh, so it, it, the hash might be a bit of a misnomer, but this is implemented in a lot of systems. In particular, uh, it was much publicized in the, the BSD implementation. Um, I found part of my answer about the Erlang runtime system here. I was quite excited when I ran into the hash timing wheel implementation, but it's only for port and proc timers, which we'll see uh, there actually is another kind of timer, which is the kind of timer that I was using uh, from the built-in functions, which is not, uh, does not use the timing wheel for, for whatever reason. Uh, but I'll defer to um, Costello and Varghese's paper about this, which explains a lot of the considerations in much more detail than I can. Uh, and it's worth noting this um, follow-up paper recently uh, where basically all of the pressures of many things that I'm hand-waving, like multiprocessor support, uh, sort of caused this to crumble and how it was um, reworked recently. Um, so there are other techniques. Um, there are like, you know, so many different ways that you could implement a priority queue. I personally think that timing wheels are really lovely um, and, um, and a really elegant idea, but uh, in the field of discrete, uh, discrete event simulation, calendar queues have been studied really heavily. Uh, there's like dozens of varieties of, uh, of this structure and um, uh, they're all quite interesting. Like I mentioned, the original cron implementation used uh, uh, one of the early calendar queue implementations. A lot of them are around this idea. Um, 
like, I guess a, a really key idea in these things, one of the reasons why, like, so some of these approaches like skip lists, red black trees, binary heaps that we saw, why they're not necessarily the best approach uh, is that there's like a, a crucial insight here, which is that if we have mostly pessimistic timers to work with, um, we want to defer sorting them for as long as possible. Like, yes, we can't, we're bounded by sort of how, how well we can sort things, but if most of the timers are going to be canceled before they ever get to expiry, we don't need to do the work of sorting them. And I think that's a really key, and that the, the hierarchical timing wheel especially embodies that idea best. Uh, so I think it's a really satisfying thing. I think it's a good example of how a uh, problem that on paper looks one way, um, you know, when you actually try to implement it, it turns out there's lots of different ways to uh, bend it into an impossible shape. Um, so it turned out that the timers I was looking for uh, were implemented with, backed by red-black trees, uh, as are the high-resolution timers in Linux. Um, so the, uh, the other timers, the timing wheel timers, um, They, uh, um, they're, they're quite interesting. They're for an imprecise timeout mechanism, which is basically what we would want for the pessimistic case in general. Um, a really key idea in that implementation, other than the bitmaps, is that um, so when we cascade, so there's lots of ways we can trade accuracy for performance there. For example, we don't, we could limit the number of times that uh, we cascade a timer and trade off accuracy there. Uh, if I recall correctly, the current Linux implementation uh, actually doesn't cascade at all, um, which it turns out is not so bad if you're, if you're willing to have a reasonable amount of slack. Um, the, uh, yeah, so there, there it's worth noting DBDK uses skip lists, which at first I thought was crazy, but in a concurrent situation might make a lot of sense. Uh, it's an interesting implementation to read, although it uh, does depend on a pseudorandom number generator, so uh, I don't know if you'd be able to do that at, at certain volumes. But, um, and Node.js makes the interesting choice of uh, using JavaScript objects keyed on the duration. Uh, the comments in that code try to be somewhat persuasive, but uh, I'm not entirely convinced that this is a good idea. Uh, although maybe there's enough v magic in V8's object representation to make this work. Anyway, as with all these things, I invite you to read the code and uh, think about it yourself. Um, there's also uh, Chazelle's soft heaps, a really promising priority queue structure uh, that's relatively new, and um, they potentially provide, I, I think this is a, an interesting future direction, um, because they're, they inherently have this kind of error bound, they might be quite good for this kind of approximate pessimistic case, uh, so that, that's something that, uh, that's worth looking into. Um, I wanted to, uh, in the whole, in the great like heap versus timing wheel debate, I wanted to bring up this quote from Jason Evans of J.E. Malloc fame, uh, you know, who says, uh, in essence, my initial failure was to disregard the difference between a, an O of one algorithm and an O of log n algorithm. In, intuitively, I think of log, logarithmic time algorithms as fast. But constant factors in large n can conspire to make logarithmic time not nearly good enough. Um, and this is, this is interesting. This, hopefully this will spur you all on to uh, make lots of benchmarks and uh, think about this because, of course, uh, I, I, do, I do have to say that, like, for example, the libev 4 heaps implementation is uh, really interesting, very aware of the memory hierarchy, and that might count more than uh, constant versus logarithmic. Um, now, so I hope that this... Uh, has given you at least some appreciation for why uh, timing facilities are actually much more interesting than you might have expected. Uh, and I hope that uh, this encourages you all to uh, go home and read the source for uh, the timer facility of your favorite systems. Um, so I want to uh, thank my employer, Adgear, for sending me here and all of you for listening today. Thank you. <laughs>